Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 20, with myself Ryan, and I'm joined by Sam this Hello. week. So, on today's show, we're going to go through a little bit of industry, Sam's going to bring us up to speed, and then we have a special treat for you guys, where we're actually joined by MJ from Microfilms, and we're joined by Martin Payne, who's a actor and producer, and we're also joined by Kieran Edwards, who you probably know from the Star Wars podcast we did back in May. Um, so other than that, over to you, Sam. Right, so considering there's been a lot of uh, pressing things in the world, there hasn't been a lot of industry news. But Cannes Film Festival decided to announce their lineup. Now, there isn't going to be an event this year. There is no big event, obvious reasons. So instead, they decided to announce what would have been on their lineup. And the lineup itself, um, it was a lot more uh, international work as opposed to more Western films you'd expect to see. Probably the biggest Hollywood film on there was The French Dispatch by Wes Anderson. From a British perspective, we have uh, Steve McQueen, who's got two films in. Steve McQueen obviously being the brilliant director of 12 Years of Slavery, Widows, uh, Shame, one of my personal favourites. He was doing this like five-part TV show for the BBC, which is now just five feature films set around West Indian lives between the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So kind of interested by that, should be an interesting collection of films. Pixar were to have an hour competition screening for their latest one, Soul. Overall, there was more of a female representation, which is something that Khan has always had a bit of a fight with. It's good. Yeah, and uh, Spike Lee chose, he, he chose an interesting collection of films. There's uh, the, the sequel to Train to Busan, uh, Pen Pen Peninsula. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one, which is kind of a surprise to see a zombie sequel in the official lineup of Khan, but different kind of film I guess yeah so there isn't that much else on the industry side like I said there's much more pressing things in the world we last week had the opportunity to launch our very first Indiegogo with HB Films for our brand new feature film Senseless now it's the first time we've ever done this and it's been going really well so far we're really appreciative of all the people who've put the time and effort into it definitely this is a very different kind of like horror film from what we've usually done for a lot more um, effects driven and something that is completely working within the whole safety of COVID. So we've got, for instance, Ryan's our main star. So that makes life a lot easier. Hello. And uh, yeah, me and Jack crewing it and taking on some of the smaller roles. But if you'd like to support that Indiegogo, there's a link that you should see just down below right now. Please click on it and give it a look. <laughs> and if you can, like... The minimum is £2, and if you can spare £2, that would be absolutely brilliant. If you can't, then just give it a little share for us and um, help it on its way, really. Everything's appreciated. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. So, moving on, me and Sam had the pleasure to sit down with MJ from Microfilms, as I said, um, Martin W. Payne, and uh, Kieran Edwards, just to discuss a little bit of the, the testing times that we're going through right now and how they're dealing with it and what it looks like for them moving forward. So here you go, guys. So today on Trash Arts Talk, we're talking about um, COVID and we're talking about filmmaking during COVID. So we want to look at what people were doing beforehand and what people are looking to do now. How do we move forward within filmmaking? So we're joined on the show by Kieran Edwards, who we spoke to a couple of weeks ago. You're a good man. We spoke to him so many yeah, times. Hey guys, yeah, guys, <laughs> Yeah, I'm a good man. Thanks for joining us, Kieran. No, thank you very much for having me back, guys. We're thank also, you very much. Oh, sorry, we're also joined by MJ Dixon from Myco. How you doing, man? Hello. How you doing? You all right? Yeah, good man. Good man. Thanks for joining us, MJ. Anytime. And we're also joined by Martin W. Payne, who is a. Uh, <clears throat> A producer on several different films, and we've not actually had a chance to have him on the show yet, so it's kind of cool. How are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm not too bad. It's quite interesting to be, uh, I suppose, breaking my duck on this subject. <laughs> I feel like it's a little bit too late to ha like, have you on. You should have been on way earlier. <laughs> like, <laughs> we've worked with you so many times that you should have just been here, like, ages ago. No, I'm just hiding my light under a bush. We see this. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. So basically, if we can, like, um, if each of you individually can go through what you were working on film-wise before this happened, and then afterwards, if we can look at um, how, how it's affected forward? you. 
So yeah, brilliant. If we start with you, Kieran. Yeah, okay, guys. Yeah, wicked. So yeah, so guys, so you know, I was um, we, we just um, we just screened the Devil's Familiar at Horror on Sea twenty twenty, and it went down really well. And I met loads of really cool guys, guys like yourselves, hello, 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 and all you other people out there. It was wonderful, and I highly recommend Horror on Sea twenty twenty for for anyone who's fanatical about horror. The atmosphere is superb. It's a great place. So yeah, so that was a real massive highlight. Um, you know, we had the Devil's Familiar like released through Dark Side releasing as well, and it's like yes, you know, everything's all ticking along nicely. And I had this vampire script that we spoke about like before, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, we had it all like um, all the scripts were sent out. Um, like, you know, I chose this this uh, entourage of awesomeness, this great cast. You know, and these wicked guys who were and, and lady, obviously Danny Thompson. She's like, you know, really up for it, and you know, the guys are well up for it. And I went out and I was scouting for locations, which, you know, which is um, over in um, Starport in Worcestershire, like where, where we live. All, all tickety tick, all great. And then all of a sudden, boom. COVID. Yeah. Lockdown. Disaster. It just everything just stopped, as, as we all know. You know, I'm not obviously going to get into it. So I kept in contact with the guys, you know, just keeping them, like, you know, asking their dietary, uh, dietary needs what they like to eat, what they're allergic to, if they're allergic to wasps things and all that sort of jazz. You know, talking about the characters, you know, and not obviously bombarding people because, blimey, you know, everyone's got their own, you know, problems and all this COVID nonsense. You know, it's it's harsh. So, you know, just kind of staying positive and just sticking at it, really, and just focusing, going through the script, getting getting through it all and, you know, trying to narrow down, like, the scenes uh, how many characters, what the characters are in those scenes and how I can work it out the, the shooting schedule, really. Mm. And MJ, where, whereabouts, uh, what were you working on just before the, before everything happened? Well, I, I, we talked, we touched on, on this briefly, I think, when I was on the show, but for mm. people who don't know or weren't listening, um, I was, we were currently working on uh, Slash House 3, um, which uh, is our biggest film to date, and it's got a cast of, like, 35 characters all fighting each other in a close proximity, you know, that kind of, um, so it's that kind of setup. Um, and then obviously with this, like we saw, we should be shooting it right now. But um, obviously with everything that happened, um, that um, it's just something that's not feasible, um, you know, to get that many people in close quarters mm. and, uh, and start shooting a film like that you know like um so that, i mean that's what what we're supposed what we were supposed to be doing uh, currently was just uh, working on this thing we also had two shorts that we were producing uh, one of which we were due to shoot like the day before all this kind of lockdown went on so frustratingly at least, at least i would have had something to edit <laughs> had this happened a couple of days later mm. and what about you mine what were you working on? Uh, well, it's interesting, and it's a nice order that we've come round in, actually, because um, I, I approach this whole thing uh, in two ways, because I, I both act and produce, and, and uh, so therefore I've got two viewpoints on it, and the first of those viewpoints is exactly, yeah, what was I working on two days before this, before Boris Johnson actually addressed us all and said, hey, we're locked down. Um, and that was on the Saturday, and I was due to be shooting a, um, a short film for MJ. Um, no. so, yeah, oh. I, I was going to be acting in what MJ can't produce um, and have anything to edit during lockdown um, on the Saturday. Oh. And I managed to wangle that in. Um, by speaking to him just to say, yeah, I can do the Saturday. I can't do the Sunday. I can't do the Sunday because I'm actually producing and directing a short film for some outfit called Trash Arts because they want (laughs) an anthology for Trash Arts Killers Free. Oh, yeah, yeah, you Um, were, weren't you? (laughs) So, therefore, that was on the Sunday. And it was actually the week before, um, uh, I suppose, yes, talking about seven days beforehand, thinking, can we, can't we? And... And it was the developing situation in that week where on the Monday, um, Sam, I think you said, oh, I've got a project coming up. 
think I'm going to have to can it um, because we just can't do it. Um, on the Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm thinking it's going to be really dodgy for doing my thing on Sunday. And I'm talking to MJ and he's thinking it's really dodgy to do his thing on Saturday. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we make that call, all of us, um, by just going into, yeah, we, this isn't going to happen. Um, we may not be in lockdown at the moment, but it, we just have to defer. So uh, both on acting and producing uh, is that situation of having projects which we are already and psyched up to do, all of us, and just having to bite the bullet of saying, yeah, we'll defer it. And we don't know when until, because this could be two weeks, it could be two months, it could be, let's hope not, two years. Um, and, uh, and, and that same thing applies through every project during this lockdown period. Um, I, I, you know, there's, I've, I've had another one which I think I've been pushed out of the project for as an actor because I just can't travel to Switzerland because I can't escape the UK. Um, and I know, Sam, it's also affected you because you've got um, at least two films in this lockdown period that you haven't been able to shoot. Well, this is the thing. We, we were all set to yeah. um, start production on a reboot of Dustin Ferguson's uh, Terror of Black Tree Forest, which obviously we couldn't really shoot a slasher in these sort of times. We were obviously writing different things and, you know, we were overly confident to have booked half the year of plans. And, uh, yeah, we had to take a step back and reconfigure how to do it. And we'd, spent, we'd actually spent quite a bit of cash on Black Tree Forest. Not like a huge amount, but we'd started buying props. We started feeling like we were prepared to go forward with it. Location scouted, which seems to always be a curse. Something to remember. Um, and yeah, like we just wanted to kind of move forward with it. And we couldn't. And I know that this brings me on to like the next part of the sort of discussion. Um, we've all tried different ways to do other creative things away from what is, let's say, traditional filmmaking. So there have been a lot of lockdown opportunities. I know that we've done like lockdown anthologies. Have you guys got involved with anything lockdown esque? I've had the uh, I've had the, the pleasure really guys of working pretty much all the lockdown. I work in the NHS. Yeah, so yeah, you're a key worker, Karen, aren't you? It's been it's been yeah, it's been pretty full on, man. I've just got to try to get stuck into the you know like really perfecting the scripts and getting all like all the props and everything ready. And my friends even are uh, making a coffin for me. Oh, nice. Well, so it's just yeah, I've not been able to do anything. Hold so on, so hold on. He's making. Really like you, Karen, Karen, Karen. He's making yeah, a coffin like for you. Is that, is that like for the bad reasons or for the film? Oh no, sorry guys, sorry. Yeah. So he's he's making that prop for the film. Sleeps in it. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that part. Do you think if you if you had a chance though that you would have done lockdown stuff? Because I know quite a lot of filmmakers aren't always comfortable with having the limitations of just working in lockdown by having the fact yeah. that it's going to be very self tape esque. I was uh, I made um, my first feature back in two thousand and nine called Target Target UK. Yeah, and uh, it's on YouTube. It's on my YouTube channel. Um, so it's about um, second. <laughs> It was set in 2019, um, and there's a terrorist attack on Britain, like on the UK, and all the tap water's poisoned, and um, loads of people are wiped out by this poison, like, it's just, just death. Um, and so that basically goes into civil war, erupts in civil war, and eventually um, gang zone, bottled water, and most people evacuate. So it's just this, I just filmed the early hours in the morning around Kidderminster, and by the M5 as well, just this silent quiet streets and just have the guys walking through like you know kind of 28 days later sort of style and uh i say like i thought i've always wanted to do a sequel for it and during the lockdown i just thought do you know what i'm just gonna get a really early one out i just stood in the middle of like ring roads and i filmed all the uh, just these empty roads thinking well I, it can be in the can for later mm. you know filming these post-apocalyptic scenes like empty McDonald's, <laughs> empty Burger King, empty Greggs, you know, just all these empty roads. I got part of the motorway briefly, but, you know, it was 
yeah, so that's about as far as I've gone, really. That's a shame, really, because, like, you're very creative, and I know, like, well, you Thank you me. are very creative, um, and I think, given this period of time, it, I appreciate the fact that you're a key worker, that's awesome, but I think yeah, if, if circumstances were slightly different, um, you probably would have had a massive platform to just jump onto and create yeah. a load of different content. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and uh, I think, you know, by setting up the GoFundMe page for Blood Demons, you know, getting the, the cash, which, which people have donated to, thank you all the people who have, that's really cool of you, your ex. <laughs> you know, kind of stick up, like, play with, like, you know, get some shots with the, um, with the drone, sort of, you know, that would have been cool to go out and just practice using the drone. Things like that, you know, that would have been, that would have been really cool. Yeah. So yeah, <clears throat> MJ, have you um, considered doing anything micro based that would be locked down? I know I noticed you've obviously started doing a podcast. Is that been more what you've wanted to do with the brand of micro rather than being constrained well, to um, lockdown filming? That's definitely been fortuitous, I think, because we started we started the podcast in January, I think. Ah. Um, with it was just obviously with, with running the Patreon, so we make like a short film like once every three months at the minute, mm. and then. Um, I, what I wanted to do was have some other stuff to kind of give people in in the interim around like the making of stuff that we do with that and everything. Um, and then obviously suddenly we couldn't film, and the podcast suddenly became like, oh well, we still kind of have a like a an entertainment channel here, so let's just kind of bump up our episode count because our, our, initially our plan was to do one every month, so we've just kind of been doing as many as we can really um, to kind of give people something. Um, you know, uh, while while we stuck to stoke the flames essentially, mm. um, until we can get back and um, shoot these these films um, that we make directly for our Patreon channel, um, and around but around that, I think um, I think I mean I've, I've over the over the last kind of twenty years, I've made a lot of films that are just kind of like made with what I have around the house and who yeah. I have around, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And so the thought of kind of doing that again didn't really appeal to me. But I think that, I, and a lot of other people were doing it. So, I, you know, you kind of feel like, oh, there's kind of a niche already filled here. So, I, you know, I, I don't really feel the need to add my voice to mm. essentially, you know, um, a kind of mountain of, of voices saying similar things. Um, so I decided that I'd take the opportunity to do uh, what I never get the chance to do is really focus on writing because so often we're, we're in production so much that I never quite get the amount of time I want or, um, on that side of it, you know, uh, because ultimately when you produce it, um, people need the script like as soon as possible. So there's a, there has to be a cutoff point. And that's so I saw this as an opportunity to go, all oh, right, well, I can sit down and spend more time with these films that. Uh, you know, writing films that I want to that I want to write, um, and so in in it's been extremely productive in that sense. And that's good, nice. and I think that's one point that, like, same with what Kieran was saying, that there is the other side that okay, use more of the time to build that creativity, make that script stronger, make those edits stronger, learn some more editing techniques. There's a lot of things you can do which aren't necessarily about being on set. Um, Maya, what would you say? Like, do you think have you done anything self tape based? Um, well, yeah. So looking at the acting side, no, uh, because uh, the opportunities I saw uh, as an actor <coughs> were actually just going down the line of yeah, please tape yourself and send it to us, and we'll use it. That's um, easy, yeah. And that just doesn't appeal to me because it. it, it it was almost a, you make your own creative decisions as an actor, do something. And you're never quite sure whether you're going to get the feedback as a director should give you the feedback if they're actually watching you perform a particular character role, uh, do some stuff. And therefore, it's all, always a case of, no. I mean, I looked at a couple of things. I looked quite closely at one and um, had a couple of scripts and just looked and thought, you know what, no, it's not right for me. Now, it, so other actors, obviously, are quite happy and comfortable doing that. Um, but for me, I just decided, no, 
um, acting side, I could take a break for a while. Um, I mean, I'm desperate to get back to it now, obviously, but um, the, the, being able to mix both acting and production side simply means there were things to be doing and getting on with as Mike says it, it, it's writing um, and just um, getting more stuff ready to go it's um, actually keeping in touch um, with the guys on the shoot that I've deferred until I don't know when from the Sunday before lockdown because I haven't put on them I need to make sure they're still on board um, so therefore You've got to have that contact and keep and make sure that they're ready to go when we can actually get a location again and when we can get filming it. Um, and I know there's obviously all sorts of stuff on production side if you've got something to work with um, that you can be doing. So it is, uh, the, the, you know, guys like yourself, Sam, just finishing the edits on any number of projects that you had got filmed. And OK, you've still got some more filming to do. But it is a lot further forward now because you haven't had to be going out and being in production mode all the time. You, you are in post-production mode. Um, so, and I think as well as that is also this coming out of this period where it is just a, okay, um, what's going to be the new norm? But before I talk about that, the other thing I have done in, in lockdown is actually with another filmmaker um, his first short film um, he wanted to run an audition process we did that via zoom um, we saw people over zoom decided on who um, they wanted for his film and he's cast his film during lockdown as part of pre-production oh, nice. just by zoom and having a table read of the script um, with the um, to make that final decision and to get the characters and the cast already knowing who they are um, and we can already see people bouncing off each other. So I think that, that is all going to be part of the new norm for film production because why try to get together physically when everyone's now suddenly discovered in the last two months the, um, the new existence of all these wonderful tools like Microsoft Martin. Teams. Martin, <laughs> Martin, can I just jump in there and say Zoom has been a lifesaver. Like, yeah. <clears throat> it's been massively brilliant. And the amount of people that I've spoken to who have um, had auditions through Zoom, or even myself, my own personal thing, is that I've managed to speak to my kids through Zoom. And it's massively helped. And um, I suppose maybe this is an industrial thing. Like, it could potentially change the way that the industry works is that you don't necessarily have to physically be there for an addition. Maybe moving forward, you could just do a Zoom. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, Skype, Skype existed, obviously, yeah. and I've done um, auditions via Skype in the past. But now this is far more um, a day-to-day -day tool. Um, yeah. It's Facebook Messenger chat as we're, we're using um, yeah, really, or, or, or any of the other products it is a way forward and it will save money and in UK independent filmmaking money <laughs> yeah yeah why do you have to bring that up <laughs> that brings us into the bigger discussion though let's, let's get into like as you said the new normal let's talk about the expectations of what we want to do for safety for our film crew and our cast and um, everything like that. And also what the the government is currently telling us is the best sort of principles. How, do, how have you guys considered that when moving forward with films? Like MJ, have you taken that into consideration with going forward with Slasher House Free? Well, I mean, I, th th this is a really, really good topic of discussion, especially this element of it, because I, I do think it's, it's, it's too early to say how anyone can approach it. I mean, the fact that we've been given kind of, well, not us personally, but the industry has been given these kind of ludicrous <coughs> um, guidelines that they've all come out and said, like, we can't follow these. Like, it just doesn't work, you know. Um, and I think that's because we're still, it's still too early to say, really. I, I mean, for me, the most important thing always has been 
and will co- continue to be more so now. Um, people think, you know, um, and um, I mean, I'll wait 10 years to make Slash House 3 if it means people will be safe. Uh, you know, I really, really don't. Um, I, I can't. I, I can't envision a world where I would risk people coming onto my set um, and something bad happening to them in any way. So, um, you know, I think for some for a project that size, definitely, um, you know, it's a case of we have to wait and see how this pans out. Really, you... really. Um, yeah. But I mean, it has afforded me the opportunity to start, like I say, um, developing. Uh, other projects okay, yeah. that don't nece- that, that ne- don't necessarily need those strict protocols in place, um, but I I think we're in we're in dicey territory right now, and I think that the big problem we've got is insurance um, mm. because I can see a lot of lawsuits coming filmmakers' ways um, if this infection rate spikes again. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. and they've caught it, it, and they've caught it on somebody's set because, like, um, my insurance certainly has already said we're not going to cover COVID nineteen cases. So get that out of your mind right now. Yeah. And my understanding is that every other insurance company has done the same. So, um, you know, very quickly, um, just by opening the set up, I think we could see ourselves in a lot of trouble potentially. I think, true, man. I think I think you've Sorry. raised a, a very valid point there. It's something that, like, personally I haven't considered. But then, like, the way that we've operated is we, we've tried to make sure that we limit the amount of people that are on set. And we've, we've closed all of our major productions, like um, the Terror of Black Tree Forest and stuff. And... Um, and we kind of came up with a new one called Senseless. Um, and that's very monetized between a very low, well, cast and crew, basically. I think there's, what, six of us in total? Yeah, I th- I think Seven of us? <clears throat> what, um, what we and... Uh, I know some people have tried to approach as well. Is, um, it's more about outside filming. Do you think that you could potentially look at getting another feature film together that would be more outside? Because I know it sounds ridiculous, and I know we want to stick to the stories we want to tell, and you're right, we should wait for the right time to be able to tell them safely. Yeah. But have you, like, I, I've just kind of, like, just had to go, right, let's just readjust. Let's just yeah. rewrite, or can we do that outside? Can we'll we do that minimalistically, new. or a new concept? Um uh, well, I've, I've just written two features while I've been in lockdown. That, oh, awesome! That nice. Adjusted themselves wow. to set. Um, you know, so I went in with the, you know, the, the the strict kind of idea of, well, let's try and keep this outdoors, you know, and that can be shot with as few people that can be as far away mm. from each other as possible, um, and and I, you know, for the most part, works that into the narrative as well, so that, um, so that that's a possibility, you know, if needed, at least specifically for one of them. Um, but again, it's going, how much of this can I set outside? How much yeah. of this can I, you know, can I, can I set, um, you know... Well, I suppose uh, cast and crew know, comes into that as well. Yeah. Well, this is another thing that we've talked about, though, is, um, I mean, we've always cast with this in mind, but um, casting people who can do two jobs... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good idea. Yeah, it's paramount yeah, in people's approach to filmmaking, at least for the next few months. Yeah, like casting makeup artists who are also actors, or uh, actors who are also gaffers, or sound people, or photographers, or you, you see where I'm going. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and just really, I mean, it's something we've always done anyway. Because our first film, we had to travel to the Isle of Man to shoot it, so we were limited on the amount of people we could take. So we. Um, we cast based on how many jobs can you do um, outside of acting. And I think that approach now will be, um, you know, very important to uh, how many productions get off the ground and, uh, you know, and see themselves through. If, um, let's, let's try and look at it from a perspective of, let's say, things do get safer, just so we can open the discussion a bit more about it. Has yeah. health and... 
I know health and safety is always a consideration on a film set, but the extra health and safety, because I know me and Martin have been discussing with um, Senseless of considerations of all the different things. In fact, Martin, could you in, um, jump in here and like just give us a bit of a brief breakdown of what's to be expected more on a film set? And also, feel free to jump in, guys. Yeah, at any point, feel free. Yeah, yeah, if, if um, yeah, of course I can. Um, the, um, I mean, I, I think where we currently are is just going to be starting the small steps. Um, we have to remain within your government guidelines. So, therefore, I'm actually on a shoot tomorrow, um, which is the first filming opportunity um, that has cropped up. And that is limited to there will be five of us. Um, it's basically me doing a monologue um, and there will be four others and it's that maintaining that social distance um, uh, you know, two metres apart, making sure for, from a filming perspective what the guidelines that have been issued by um, the British Film Commission and the um, Advertising Producers Association, the UK Screen Alliance are uh, all saying is Yes, you can film, or we will be able to film, we will be able to get things done, but it is the added um, paperwork impact, but don't have paper because that carries the virus. So it's, it's all the planning beforehand. And one thing that I did today um, was um, within the guidelines, it's things like saying when people turn up on set, you have to take their temperature. Um, you have to make sure that they understand everything about COVID-19 and have they potentially got it. Because if they have, no, they're not coming in. Yeah. Um, and, the, and, and making sure that any records you've got of who was involved, you have to be able to say, yeah, we know exactly who was on a particular shoot on a particular day for at least the 14 days afterwards, just in case one of those comes back to you and says, I've just come down with a bit of a temperature and a bit of a cough and it's a bit, you know, I'm a bit worried and I'm going to go into self-isolation because that's what people should be doing. And so therefore, that's where we currently are in this real morass of can we see our way out of it? Ultimately, yes, we can. But if I look a year ahead, it's still going to be, as MJ saying, get the story to fit what you can do. Um, um, and we may have more cast and crew around, but I bet we'll still be going, we just need to be a bit distance. We need to make sure we've got good hygiene, plenty of fresh air going into the location, particularly if it's inside. Um, and... Um, but equally, I agree with um, with Mike when he's saying that um, some of the regulations you just can't abide by because one of them, um, I've been speaking to um, Katie of the regular makeup artist that we use um, on, on trash art stuff, um, is, um, is saying, yes, I will wear a mask because I have to, because that's what it says, but I can't wear latex gloves because they'll interfere with the makeup. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> That's that's the level of where people disagree with what's coming out, but actually there's a sense behind why we're doing it, and uh, it's going to be very interesting picking away through that. Um, and the other important thing I would have to say, of course, is that it's very easy to say, "Hey guys, you, we we know each other. We're we're very happy together, working together." Um, don't sue us if you get anything. Yeah. Um, and in fact, would you actually sign this paper, so a piece of paper that says, I take all responsibility of and liability for catching anything? Because as filmmakers, as production companies, um, you just cannot get people to take the liability away from you, the producer. No, not at uh, all. That's going to be there. And that's why, you know, MJ say insurance companies won't cover it. And there will be a raft of claims because people will say, I got it from that set, yeah. whether they know that or not, doesn't matter. See, see Kieran, um, how do you see all this? Because like being someone who's, you know, part of the NHS, do you think realistically the guidelines that have been put in place are realistic? That's it. We, you know what? We just have to stick to the rules. We have to stick to the guidelines. Yeah. You know, we need to we need to get it out. We need to get rid of this virus. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, what everybody wants. But I think that... Yeah, it's just it's obviously now I'm 
I don't know the ins and outs of these sorts of things like but we just need to keep I think the key is to just keep the social distancing really the two metres which yeah. <sighs> totally sucks totally sucks in the filmmaking world as, you know as we just discussed it's just oh but, but Kieran, in, in terms of the um, two metre rule, um, yeah, that's fine as we stand on the um, 5th of June. But in the overall government um, blueprint for getting out of this, yeah. on the 4th of July, that's anticipated to come down to one metre. Why? Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Which is, it means we might be able to hug soon. How awesome oh, would no, that be? No, no, Ryan. No, no, never. <laughs> Oh, no, you still don't want to hug me, Martin? Is that, is that what it no. is? <laughs> can I... I've pretty much hugged everyone at Horror on Sea, so... Kieran. I want it back. Sorry, yeah. Can I just make a point? So, like, from a film perspective, what is your perspective of the whole social distancing and the way that um, film in general has to change to make films... I just think, oh, I don't know, I'm just thinking of a way of just making the shots more closer. So rather than you've got everybody stood right next to each other, or even have like a scene where you've got two people having a conversation, have the one person in the room, you film them, at obviously at hopefully a metre distance. And then that person goes out, they come in, the next person, then you have the, obviously the flip side of that conversation with the other person stood at a metre distance. Yeah. So it's more of a technical setup. You could wear, you could wear a mask. You could mm. wear a visor. You know, gloves. Know. There's no point wearing gloves. It's, it's, no, don't wear gloves. No, but, no. You, know, you need to wash your hands. You know, yeah. sanitize your hands. Like you know. Yep. Anyway, so we won't go into that. But no, I don't know. Look, that, that's what you know. That's maybe like, like maybe one of the things we could do. Maybe I'm thinking. I'm just so, certainly add it all together. In, in what I've read, Kieran, um, it, the, the guidelines have come out because I have gone through them. Um, it, it, it is talking about, or I, I expect there will be a period of time when filmmakers, um, particularly camera operators, um, DOPs, cinematographers, whatever we're going to call them, um, get very used to being able to shoot two people having a conversation and split screening, making it look as though they are actually talking together. Um, yeah shortening that distance between two people just by going for the right camera angle that means they can be one or two metres oh, yeah. apart. And lighting as well, isn't it? Lighting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah different lenses yeah. as well. You know, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's fairly achievable. Uh, but I think um, it won't be long before the, those limitations, like the limitations in, in, from lockdown films and stuff, really start to show themselves. Yeah. 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 It's just the horrid of, you know, somebody, oh, I don't know, you know, that person just, I don't know, go outside for a fag and someone walks past and coughs, you know, just a random person, you know what I mean? Just something yeah, really yeah. bad and they just come, yeah, I'm wondering back in, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, and it's like, like you said, the whole, oh, the lawsuits and all that sort of shit, you just, oh, it just sounds hideous, man. I don't know that. But we've got to keep going, we've got to keep fighting it. We'll do it. We'll work out a way. Yeah. I think, um... definitely. Just to return to a comment um, said like ages ago about um, community, like it is a shame that we've all been to Horror on Sea, we all went to Horror on Sea in January and we all met different people and we got new creatives involved with the different films we were working on and it does feel like there is those restraints by going well we have to limit to filming from a lot closer perspective because we literally this year all of us have expanded our own network and we're being forced to bring it back. So I can see why there's there's a, a restraint to to want to continue to to have to constantly adapt, but I feel like adapting at this point is only the it's the only kind of way forwards. And I feel like one of the things that we we're all working class filmmakers. We have always had to adapt by the fact that not, this is not always our first job. This is uh, sometimes it's something that we have to do on the weekend. So we've always had to naturally adapt as filmmakers. I think hopefully that will play into how we come out of this. Definitely. Yeah, stronger. Yeah, yeah. That's that's all I can hope for is that we will become stronger from it because we've all had the dream and we're still trying to achieve achieve the dream where any any boundary is supposed to not matter because this is all what we all want. I think as well, just to touch on what Sam's saying, is um, like we've been doing the podcast since January, believe it or not. 
And um, we've done it through difficult times and we've had to improvise and come up with new ideas and, um, yeah, just kind of work on the fly, I suppose. Um, but what we have done within that time, and Horror on Sea helped this, is that we've reached out to a new network of people that we may not have like been able to work with before. Um, or we, we may have met at Horror on Sea, but then we've kind of, like, I don't know, just gotten communication with them. Yeah, I suppose and people have had more of a chance to talk to each other more. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, like you, open. Karen, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, that's always a bit, man, with Tom and Baz. Well, you and, think uh, about, yeah. well, yeah, exactly. And you think about our relationship, like we've bonded over Star yeah. Wars, for example. And, um, oh, definitely, bro. Um, even beyond that, like I'm sure you would right. introduce us to other people. So the network grows. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a universal idea in general that the only way we can get through this is by working together. Yeah. But when it comes to filmmaking, it's something that like it has to be that way. There is no other way around it. And it's true. You just get stronger bonds with everyone, and we can. You you're gonna. Hopefully, with everyone learning more skills and understandings, we can only share yeah, it with each other. Well, yeah. yeah, exactly. I think, I think from one of my perspectives, so, like, um, we're obviously talking about how we kind of get out of this situation, how we move forward, etc. Um, one of the greatest things that we've done, um, and I, I can't talk for any of you guys, but I'm sure you guys are in the same boat, is we've just written loads of stuff. And... We've produced things on the fly, like um, You're Gonna Be a Star, for example. Just a little random horror comedy thing. It's yeah, it's, it's, off it's, the fine, cuff. it's finding yeah, different yeah, ways to keep it. creative, isn't it? Exactly. It. But it, even like with that, like we've, we've put stuff out there that's on the fly, but also we've been doing stuff behind the scenes that are actually going to probably better us and make us bigger in the long term because they're decent projects well we hope we hope depending on what people think of it and stuff no they're know. decent projects i'm, I'm ah, throwing no, my neck out good. there <laughs> but i'm gonna I'm gonna summarize though let's let's just summarize what what do we think are the just the key things to try and take out of this when it comes to moving forward as indie filmmakers if people just want to shout stuff out I think the key thing to come out of this um, at the moment is people have got to stay safe. Um, I know that's government advice, um, but there is a way out of it. It is small steps to start with at the moment, and it will take us probably two years to get back to no. where we might have been. Um, and it's having the creative ideas now, making the best use of time now, and just going, I can't do that. But it's in the pile to be done. Mm. And at some point, as, as, as Mike says, slash house three, it, he'll wait 10 years to make it because it deserves to be made. Not, and also... And so therefore, let's take that forward. Let's just continue yeah. to make when it's right. And yeah. also, missing yeah. you, Martin. Missing I you. I mean, <laughs> I think as well, what we've got to remember is that, uh, I've, I find myself saying this constantly in a minute, but I think what we've got to remember is that, like... <clears throat> It's, it's better to wait too long and everyone be okay than everyone try to desperately get back to how things were too yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah definitely. And because ultimately, if this spikes a second, third, fourth time, it's just going to go on for years and years and years. And yeah. I think what we need to do is just really, really take a step back. If you think it's safe, wait another two weeks and just, you know, like... You know, to be sure, you know, uh, it, it's little things like that, that I think, because like I say, we can wait too long and all that happens is we get to make films for the rest of our lives. But, you know, if we wait too, you know, too short, chances are we might not be around to make these things. Yeah, that, exactly. That's scary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree. It's also, it's also balance because, mm. as I say, I, I, I'm on a shoot tomorrow. It's a very small one, five people. Um, and I've already got in my head that, okay, I'm doing that. I accept there's going to be risks in that. And I also accept that for the 14 days after that shoot, I am not going to do anything mm, that I might 
repeat my risk. Um, and, and that's where I am at the moment. So, you know, something, some opportunity comes up in seven days' time, no, because you can't, uh, uh, you we've can't got to wait uh, 14 days. It's got to be yeah, safe. That's it. Yeah. I'm to- yeah, totally. I think we should um, definitely just hold on, you know, just, just kind of wait. And absolutely, we should just wait till it, you know, hopefully there's no more spikes in or anything. We just need to stay kind of positive as well, really, as well. You know, just keep keep creative. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us, guys. It's been an interesting chat. And hopefully, I don't know, we, we might help someone or just give them a perspective of what, you know, what, what indie filmmakers are thinking right now, really. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Keep safe, and uh, guys, we'll speak to you soon. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. You guys take care of yourself. And you guys, thanks for having me on. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care. So, guys, we really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. As ever, give us a like, leave a comment, um, and also give us a share. And most importantly, please subscribe. And don't forget, there's a link in the bottom of this video with the um, senseless Indiegogo. Um, So yeah, if you can support with that, that would be absolutely fantastic. And as ever, thanks for listening. Trash Arts Takeout.